Well, welcome everyone to a Boond Econ Talk, a very special edition of Biz Talk here on CGTN. I'm Michael Wong. We are here at the fifth Bund Summit in Shanghai. The theme of this year's summit is China and the World, a New Journey, a gathering of global minds where we have some of the world's top thinkers in economics, in finance, in development gathered here in Shanghai to talk more about how do we build consensus? How do we promote more global cooperation? And how do we build an open and sustainable global economy? So we are seeing, of course, right now, perhaps rising risks of economic fragmentation, jeopardizing the decades, I think, of development, peace, uh, prosperity, and stability that we have seen uh, as an international community. So how do we perhaps resolve some of these challenges? So to talk more about that and much more, we're joined here at the summit by Mari Pangestu, who is Professor of International Economics at the University of Indonesia, uh, also formerly the World Bank Managing Director of Development Policy and Partnerships. So, Professor Pangestu, welcome to the program. Thank you, Michael. We're also joined by Dean Yao Yang, Dean at the National School of Development of Peking University. So, Dean Yao, welcome as well. Uh, I want to start with a very big and very broad question mm -hmm. because we are talking about perhaps how do we boost multilateralism and global cooperation at, mm -hmm. this, at this year's Bund Summit. How concerned are you about the rising risks of global economic fragmentation? And I'm just thinking to one example right now, the Paris Climate Agreements of 2016. I'm not too sure the international community can really come to a consensus on that in this day and age. So as we stand right now in 2023, how concerned are you about economic fragmentation? Mm -hmm. Professor Pankestu, let me start with you first. Uh, I'm very concerned uh, as someone who has sort of grown up in the last three decades uh, with multilateralism and seen the importance of multilateralism for development. And I think in, in East Asia, China, Southeast Asia, and the rest of East Asia, we have seen how openness in trade, investment, uh, financial, capital, has really uh, boosted growth and development and reduced poverty. Mm. But all that is really now being put in question. You, you mentioned climate, but I think we are already seeing uh, fragmentation on, on trade, uh, starting even before this current uh, escalation of the US-China trade war. Uh, it was uh, started in 2016, I guess, uh, when uh, Trump exited TPP and basically exited WTO, the role of the US. Mm. I think the multilateralism in the, on the trade side and many other, I guess the whole global economic order doesn't work without uh, US uh, as the major power leading, leading the system. So multilateralism worked, you know, post-World War and, and so on, because everybody multilaterally agreed to a set of rules and systems and, an insti and institutions. Different institutions are in charge of, uh, uh, of the rules and the system. And you know, in the last two decades, developing countries were more involved mm. in that process. And it worked because you had uh, major powers like the US, including also with uh, EU and others, to enforce the rule and continue the process, right? And bringing along developing countries along the way, right? Now that that part is now no longer there. So this is the big question for us in this forum. How should we proceed with multilateralism given that situation and the escalation of the bilateral tensions and the geopolitics? Mm. So uh, uh, do, to me, the answer should be the rest of the world should continue. <laughs> and I, I, I have a kind of a framework to answer this, if I may. Basically, I'm calling it uh, constructive incrementalism. <laughs> it, what does it mean? First, it means we should continue to uh, uh, preserve the multilateral uh, order and system that exists already. It's not about overhauling the system. Mm. It's there. Let's continue to strengthen it. In the trade world, it would mean making sure uh, things in the WTO continue to move, reforms in the WTO, uh, however small, continues. Dialogue continues in the multilateral sense. And if you can't get 150 countries to agree, you go plurilateral, which means a subset of countries can continue on different parts of the agenda, like they are doing now with services and digital. Second, regional. Uh, so countries with different groupings and like-minded countries can continue on different issues and continue on many other fronts. And this is why regional economic integration uh, 
should continue, should uh, proceed. And middle powers like the EU and Japan they mm. and, and ASEAN, we need to continue to uh, make sure openness continues, not just in trade, but in all areas. But it should be transparent and inclusive. Mm. Inclusive is the hardest part <laughs> to, to, to achieve. And it already has happened, actually, since the exit of uh, the U.S. from the multilateral trading system uh, and, and glo global economic order in 2016. You had CPTPP, you know, U.S. left TPP, it became CPTPP. Japan led the process, and there are like 12 countries in there. And then you have the East Asia Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which is what you led by ASEAN. It includes China. Mm -hmm. That was concluded in 2019. Uh, and now you have the U.S. also has its own initiative, IPEF, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, uh, which has a different set of countries. But these are all, uh, I would say, just continue to move. And then the bilateral side. And then the final thing which is going to be complicated is where do you address, hopefully multilaterally, otherwise you will end up with the fragmentation and the different blocks on technology. Mm. Because technology doesn't belong in any of these institutions yet. What about the rules on technology, on 5G, on 6G, or whatever comes after that, on AI? Uh, where does that come in? Uh, we need to figure out. Uh, otherwise, you're going to have different blocks. You're going to end up with different technology blocks. And that is not going to be uh, beneficial for us because uh, technology and digital should be one of the drivers for development uh, and, and growth in the forthcoming future. Yeah, that sounds like a pretty tall order, uh, Professor. Yes. Uh, Dean <laughs> Yao, what do you think? <laughs> Your concerns about economic fragmentation? Because it seems like maybe the international community, we haven't dealt with this before. Mm -hmm. People like to use the Cold War term, but during that era, the world was not as interconnected. Mm -hmm. Even pre-World War II, pre-World War I, the world was not as interconnected. And now mm -hmm. we're talking about the potential risks of economic fragmentation in mm -hmm. a world where we are so interconnected. So do we know how to do that mm -hmm. as an international community, how to resolve these kind of challenges when we're so interconnected? What are your right, thoughts? Right, right. Um, yeah, yeah, currently, uh, we all uh, say that the United States uh, doesn't like uh, the current world system. The United States uh, wants to have some change. Don't forget, uh, the current world system was created by the United States, right? Uh, so the question is why the United States now doesn't like uh, the system it created right, for so long and maintained for so long. I think uh, the key reason uh, is that uh, China has been the single most uh, important uh, player that has been benefiting from the current uh, world system, right? And uh, China has been become so big, and in a sense, uh, has become a challenger to the United States in many fronts. Uh, so the uh, United States uh, believe the current uh, system is not working toward American interests. I mean, uh, to a large extent, I can understand the American uh, stand, right? If uh, the current uh, system is against me, why should I invest a lot of efforts uh, into the system, okay? Uh, particularly, not just because of China, but also particularly the changes uh, happening in the United States, okay? Uh, the enlarging income disparity, you know, a few people, 1% or 0.1% of the population has become super, super rich. Right, and uh, the vast majority has uh, been staying poor. Right, uh, half uh, of the American population has not uh, increased uh, their income over the last uh, 50 years. Mm. Okay, and look at the, those super rich, and look at the Wall Street, and look at the uh, Silicon Valley. Mm. Uh, can you believe uh, a fresh PhD can earn 300,000 US dollars? Mm. <laughs> yeah. In Silicon Valley. Mm. <laughs> what about the, the median mm. uh, household income in the United States? Uh, yeah. 70,000? Mm -hmm. About that. Yeah. Right? So that's uh, the income disparity mm. over there, right? Mm. And adding on that uh, immigration, you mm. turn on the TV, you see immigrants mm. are flocking into the mm. United States. All sorts of things, right? So I, I think that we, I don't like a Trump, but Probably Trump uh, has uh, asked uh, the right question to Americans. Mm. 
what are American? Mm. How are we going to define United States? Mm. That's a serious question. We cannot just say, uh, no, 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 there is no such a question. Uh, uh, liberals in, in the U.S. always say, no, 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 that's not a mm. question, that's not mm. a question. Uh, they are cheating themselves. Mm. Uh, you have to be real. Mm. That's the real question, right? So the United States uh, uh, has to address those questions. Mm -hmm. right? Internationally, uh, I can see a greater shift. Uh, United States wants to change the system, but the, the first thing is that United States probably has to negotiate a new agreement, you know, a set of agreements uh, with China, right? because uh, that's uh, the elephants, the two elephants in the room, right? The two countries have to first uh, agree on a set of rules in order for us to increase or to resume uh, those international organizations, right? I actually, uh, sorry, can I call you uh, first yeah, sure, name? Yeah, sure, of course. <laughs> <laughs> call me uh, Yao Yang or just uh, Yang, all right? Um, I, mm, a little bit suspicious about regionalism. Right? Uh, you mentioned that you have, we have to be careful not to be exclusive. But we have been seeing that as being exclusive, right? Um, TPP was designed to exclude China. Everyone mm -hmm. knows that, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> uh, then, you know, your United States and uh, Europe uh, are negotiating uh, cross border mm -hmm. uh, data. Uh, what was that? Uh, 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 Cross-border movement of yeah. data. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, if uh, they reach agreement, then that's going to exclude uh, China and other countries. Okay. So regionalism is so easily to be used as a tool to exclude certain countries. Uh, if the, we want to avoid this kind of fragmentation, parallel systems, uh, probably we still need to work uh, toward kind of uh, all-inclusive uh, uh, international system. Uh, the, in building that, the uh, United States and the China are the two most uh, critical players. Mm. Yeah. Would you like to respond to that, Professor? Because you mentioned like-minded countries working together, and I get that. It's easier. But if we really want to see true multilateralism playing out, where we can solve some of humanity's mm -hmm. common challenges, uh, like Dean Yao was saying, perhaps regionalism may potentially mm -hmm. lead to more fragmentation. How do we square that? Okay, let me, if I may, uh, slightly disagree with <laughs> Yan, <laughs> Yang. <laughs> uh, uh, in, in terms of your description of the situation, I think I think it's, uh, yes, I agree that the U.S. needs to look at its own, uh, how to, to figure out their own problem. Mm. But what they should be doing is doing their homework <laughs> domestically. <laughs> right now, uh, there's a lot of blaming, right? It's mm. easier to blame your problems on China or on globalization. And I, I, but now with Biden, actually, he shifted to, okay, we have now an industrial policy to make Am America great again. Right. Uh, Trump was just saying, make America great ag again by <laughs> reducing deficit with other countries. But at least uh, under Biden, he has come up with uh, an industrial policy to, re you know, because the problem is increasing productivity and innovation mm. uh, in the U.S. That's how you compete, right? right. <laughs> this is the normal situation. Mm. Uh, but unfortunately, I think it's, even the industrial policy now is actually very mixed with security concerns. Mm -hmm. So right. what we haven't really mentioned, the fragmentation is happening because we are now having efficiency, having to be balanced with resilience mm -hmm. to shocks, mm -hmm. security concerns uh, of two, uh, you know, s supply chain dependency and concentration. And mm -hmm. then you are mixed up also with the US-China geopolitical situation. So unless you accommodate these uh, issues within the multilateral order, you will, will, you will continue to have this, this conflict. And uh, my prediction is that we will continue to see fragmentation. You will see continued concerns about this. It's being called de-risking. Mm -hmm. At least mm -hmm. it's not decoupling anymore. <laughs> it's de-risking. But nobody seems to have a good definition yeah. of how we should de-risk minimizing the cost on efficiency. You're going to end up with uh, less efficiency, 
higher cost, right. uh, and it will hurt the developing countries the most. This is this is kind of the world we're going to. So I think what we we have to be looking at is how do we minimize the cost yeah. because it's going to happen, right? So mm -hmm. I, I think what I, I'm recommending is not just regionalism. I think we have to do parallel. We have to do what we can to maintain the multilateral uh, rules and system because it is the best. It it's mm. still talking about openness, inclusiveness, transparency. Mm. The inclusiveness part for us is very important as you mm. know, uh, I, that was the benefit of us being part of the multilateral system. So take something like the WTO. They have a security clause mm. and Trump has liberally used it. It has re been rarely used, now it's being used linked with trade. Mm. And what we can do is look at it carefully at the multilateral level and mm -hmm. at the regional level, how do you actually have a sensible policy on what does a, a resilient supply chain mean? You know, uh, mm -hmm. valid, how do you separate valid security concerns from protectionism, basically, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I think it, can, it should happen at the multilateral level and it should happen at the regional level. I'm, mm -hmm. I was re I'm recommending that, say, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, it's always being updated. They should actually mm -hmm. come up with a mm -hmm. good uh, framework and process for what does a resilient supply chain mean? Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. it's, it's key for our region. Mm -hmm. And at least RCEP, I can't say the others are like that, but RCEP is inclusive. That mm -hmm. is the principle, mm -hmm. uh, openness and inclusiveness. And uh, that's why mm -hmm. for me, coming from Southeast Asia, we, uh, all of our regional integration has been based on multilateral principles. Mm -hmm. What we do is we start first with our part of the world, but we keep it open. Like yeah, right. all of the ASEAN agreements, you, you uh, reduce tariffs amongst yourselves, but then you make it mu multilateral, you mm. MFN it, right? Mm. Uh, and so on, right? Uh, unfortunately, the other agreements are not in that frame. <laughs> so I think we need to make sure that we in the region, because China is part of our CEP, we need to show the way that this is how it should be done. Uh, and it may not add up, as you said. Uh, there's a big debate that's been going on ever since uh, I have been doing international trade. Are regional uh, agreements stumbling blocks <laughs> or mm. building blocks? Mm. So we need to steer it towards kind of building, building blocks. blocks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, certainly CPTPP has, uh, that is not clear how they're going to uh, mm -hmm. allow uh, uh, countries to join. China has actually applied. Right. So we shall see uh, yeah. how, how they will do that. Uh, but I, I think, I, I think that, that we, ne we just need to uh, make progress in an incremental way in, where, in whichever uh, forum we can. Uh, uh, because what our objective is to, as I said, minimize the cost. Yeah. Well, you are the optimist, uh, Mari, yes, as yes. you said so <laughs> yes. yourself. But do you think openness is a little bit harder to maintain if we see a new era, let's say, of slower global growth? Because yes. now we have inflation mm -hmm. still yep. quite mm -hmm. elevated in many parts of the world. Mm -hmm. Headline inflation has come down, but we might see sticky inflation. We might see higher interest mm -hmm. rates for longer. Uh, rising geopolitical mm -hmm. tensions, we're talking about the rising risks of mm -hmm. economic fragmentation. Isn't it just a little bit more difficult to maintain openness? Maybe economies just naturally will feel more protectionist in an era like this. I mean, how do we make sure we still steer societies and economies towards openness in that case? Oh, that's a challenging question. <laughs> 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 but uh, yeah, you're right. And it goes back to your earlier point about, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of the Lashback against globalization that actually started, uh, especially since the global financial crisis in mm. 2008, is because the feeling uh, that it has led to lack of distribution of the gains yeah. of uh, globalization. And I think that feeling is still true. Yeah. Uh, and especially, as you said, with slower growth, uh, countries, including you know, advanced countries, all of them, and, <laughs> and developing countries, we are all wanting to have some kind of industrial policy uh, to protect mm. Uh, well, they, they don't call it protectionism. They say we want to develop the industries in our country mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. our own uh, growth and competitiveness. But they do end up being uh, somewhat protectionist because it's introducing a lot of trade restrictions as well as investment mm -hmm. restrictions. Mm -hmm. uh, and that will affect uh, efficiency. That will affect growth, actually. Yeah. Uh, so we are already in a slow growth situation. It's going to uh, affect uh, growth. 
uh, even more, right? Yeah. If you if you actually continue to do this, the f the cost of uh, fragmentation. I mean, the the recent IMF report said it can lead to anything from zero point two percent to seven percent uh, cost of your GDP. Mm. And if you have technology competition mixed up in there, it's even higher. It's eight to twelve percent. So yeah. the cost is real and high. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is something that I think we have to keep on reminding ourselves and policymakers. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, but we also have to be realistic, as you said. We have to s recognize that countries mm -hmm. are going to have uh, this industrial policy approach. Countries will want to have some kind of uh, social, they need to have come up with some kind of social policy in a very fiscally constrained space, mm -hmm. yeah. right? So I would say that a lot of homework for domestic uh, policy uh, to, to do the, to do, uh, s what do you call it? smart industrial policy, right? Mm -hmm. That that because if you look at all the analysis, it's gonna hurt you also. It's yeah. not just hurting uh, mm -hmm. your the third countries, it's also gonna hurt you. It's not and not achieve what mm -hmm. you want to achieve. Mm. So how do you do sensible uh, industrial policy? If, because develop the problem is developing countries don't have sub don't have the fiscal space to do subsidies. Yeah. The way they do it mm -hmm. is by using trade restrictions mm -hmm. and local content requirements. Mm. or investment restrictions. Mm. And that, mm. that can actually not be beneficial to them in the end. They may actually get cut out yeah. uh, of, of the competitive supply chain. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And then there's, uh, I just wanted to come back to your, you, you, two points already, you come back on the climate, right? Mm -hmm. Clim we haven't talked about climate, but uh, today to be competitive, you have to be part of the sustainable supply chain yeah. as well. So, you know, the fact that you, they, uh, uh, buyers or investors want renewable energy as the source of energy for, for uh, producing in your country mm -hmm. means that you do have to make that decision also on, th on the climate change and the energy transition, for instance. Yeah. And that's another uh, area uh, where I think you, you started off with saying, where's the multilateral cooperation? Yeah. Uh, there are all these nice statements and pledges, but if you look carefully, Nothing, none of that is, has come to, to fruition to help countries to actually do the energy transition. Yeah. I yeah. mean, the latest UN report said that we are pretty off track yeah. when it comes to meeting the uh, Paris Climate yeah. Agreement goals. Um, Dinya, I want to come back to you because you mentioned the United States. You actually was moderating a session earlier today, speaking mm -hmm. to the former U.S. Uh, Treasury Secretary Robert Rubin, and he essentially said that mm -hmm. um, China-U.S. relations, essential for mm -hmm. life on Earth. Mm -hmm. That is a pretty bold statement. Obviously, right. if we want the global economy to do well, if we want more openness in the global economy, we have to have stronger uh, and more robust cooperation between China and the United States. Mm -hmm. I mean, hasn't multilateralism and globalization benefited the United States as well? I mean, w how concerned are you about the U.S. and the rhetoric right now coming from Washington? Well, uh, certainly the United States has uh, benefited, but uh, the benefits uh, have not been well spread, I guess. Yeah, distributed evenly across the population, right? Mm. And also for Americans, uh, they believe that China has uh, gained more than the United States, right? So that's uh, also quite important uh, to frame uh, the sentiment in you know, the United States, right? On the one hand, you know, globalization has created so many poor people in our country. But on the other hand, the Chinese have uh, become much richer than before. Uh, so I can understand that. Right? If I were American, I would uh, probably think the uh, same way. Right? That's uh, the fact. Okay? Uh, so I, I don't think uh, we need uh, to play this uh, blaming game, mm -hmm. right? uh, like the current uh, the two countries are doing. Right? You are wrong, you are wrong. Uh, this is just a fact. We have to find a way to deal with it. Right? Um, to me, U.S.-China relations uh, cannot go back to the old days, right? Al although you know, we are still talking about the co collaboration uh, in some areas, uh, but the essence of the relationship is not competition, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah, so for China and the United States, uh, the more urgent thing to do is uh, uh, to create a set of new rules to governing the competition, right? Mm. So let's think about the Cold War. Mm. Uh, in the first uh, decade uh, and a half, or some, something, right? The United States and the uh, Soviet Union had this uh, uh, 
uh, Lauren is a competition. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Should we call that? Mm -hmm. Right? So they compete on all friends yeah. and no rules. Yeah. And finally, they got to the point of the Cuban uh, missile crisis. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And at that point, the, the two countries thought, oh my God, we could uh, have uh, started a nuclear war. So we should come to the table and negotiate a set of rules mm. Mm. Right, to, to contain this kind of risk. Mm. Uh, China and the United States uh, today are quite different, but still we face uh, this kind of risk. Mm. Right? That is, the competition mm. goes wild mm. right, and destroys uh, mm. uh, the, the whole system mm. and even leading to military conflict. Mm -hmm. right? Uh, so to me, I, I think that the two countries uh, have needs uh, to negotiate mm -hmm. new rules. And like like mm -hmm. Bob uh, said in the morning, as long as uh, the two sides uh, sit down yeah. mm -hmm. and talk to each other, there will be improvements. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 But what if come 2024, a new administration comes in, how difficult do you think might it be to talk? Because right now, perhaps the trust between the two sides is not at a very high level. Yeah. How do we restore trust? Is it just about communication? What more needs to be done? Perhaps more people-to-people -people exchanges. That always helps, I feel. Yeah, definitely. Um, I cannot imagine if Trump comes back again. <laughs> Let's forget about that. Right? <laughs> uh, if uh, Biden uh, gets his second term, I think U.S.-China relations uh, will be stabilized. At least stabilized. Right, mm -hmm. right. Um, I mean, the Biden administration, when it deals with China, has become more systematic on the one hand. But on the other hand, it has become more rational. Mm -hmm. That's good, okay? Um, I'm not expecting the United States uh, to come back uh, to cooperate with China mm -hmm. off all fronts. Mm -hmm. uh, that's past, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, if uh, the American government becomes more rational and more systematic, that means uh, China and the United States uh, has some chances to sit mm. down and talk. Mm. Um, I think uh, uh, the commerce sector is uh, with it. Uh, Romano mm. is uh, with it uh, to China. Has uh, reached uh, some concrete mm. outcomes, mm -hmm. for example, mm -hmm. uh, US and China are going to set up a working group Mm. at the wise means uh, yeah. stereo level. Mm. Uh, that's good. Yeah, mm. uh, talk uh, is actually mm. uh, going to help. Mm -hmm. Help a lot. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, my own experience uh, tells me that so we have been running a U.S.-China economic dialogue uh, for now 14 years. Mm. So this is a track two dialogue, right? Mm -hmm. So. Uh, in the first few years, uh, the gap between American participants mm. and Chinese participants uh, were huge. Mm. But now, you know, <laughs> we have been converted. Mm. <laughs> in a sense, uh, we feel that, oh, we don't have uh, any new things mm. to talk about because we know each other so well, mm -hmm. right? Uh, uh, our views converge. Yeah. Th that says a lot. Yeah. Mm. So as long as the lines of communication and dialogue remain open, that's the foundation, right? We yeah. need to start there. Right. Okay. I want to talk about China's economy, and I want to ask you both this. Uh, Professor, l let me start with you, because China has been a major contributor to the global economy. Um, from 2013 to 2021, the World Bank estimated that China's contribution uh, average on an annual basis was nearly 40%. Right now, people, of course, are looking at the Chinese economy. There might be some twists and turns when it comes to the recovery process. How do you see the future of China's economic contribution to global growth? Uh, I think even though there will be a slowdown in growth, it'll still be uh, significant, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and included in there are the other uh, emerging developing economies, especially in East Asia. Yeah. Uh, and the fact that the growth between these, between China and the rest of uh, Asia, has become very intertwined. Yeah. You know, uh, China has been the largest investment and trading partner for Southeast Asia now for a, a, a number of years. But ASEAN, I was told, became China's largest trading partner mm -hmm. for the first time uh, la uh, last year, I think. Yeah. So it it means that. 
it's it's actually part of this adjustment in the uh, you can call it fragmentation, but it actually preceded all this in the sense that China was already experiencing increased costs, uh, so there was already relocation of investment mm. going on. But n now uh, it is not based on efficiency only, right? right. It's based <laughs> on uh, all this uh, security concern and and delinking this decoupling and de-risking uh, process has actually accelerated it, but not in a kind of the way you'd want to do it in the yeah. efficiency way, right? So I think what we need to do is to make sure that uh, the growth be between China and the rest of the region continues through the regional integration that I was uh, indicating. And second thing I would say is that I think China, uh, I think we, we think China will still continue to grow, but it's a normal process when you have grown at a very high pace that you, you, you're, you are experiencing structural changes. Yeah. Uh, and actually within those structural changes, uh, there is a kind of a, maybe a, a complementary uh, kind of process that can help, that can benefit uh, and be opportunities also uh, for Southeast Asia. But I think a lot rests on what China will do domestically. Mm. Uh, and I think Din Yao is probably more competent to, <laughs> to comment on that. But I, you know, everybody talks about the real estate issue, about the aging population. Uh, and how to revive domestic consumption, uh, and, and so on. And I do think a lot has to do with kind of more domestic policies mm -hmm. uh, that will uh, raise the consumption versus savings. Mm -hmm. uh, and, mm -hmm. and it does lead to the, the kind of uh, social programs that are effective, targeted uh, social protection mm -hmm. systems uh, that perhaps needs to be uh, increased in China so that you can get this uh, jump in consumption. Mm. Uh, savings rate in China is 35%, if I'm not mistaken. No, 45. 45, <laughs> or <was> even higher, <laughs> compared to like 15% in the US, uh, <laughs> and the rest of Asia is also low. So What's the saving rate in the Indonesia? It's about 20%. 20 uh, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So, uh, you know, how, how to, I think the domestic consumption growth is, mm -hmm. is a challenge, as well as, uh, reviving investment growth, uh, not just through infrastructure, right. but productive uh, investment, mm. uh, and so on. So I, I think I, I think actually a lot of the countries now are facing this kind of structural transformation mm -hmm. challenges, which requires uh, mm. reforms domestically, mm. uh, addressing some of the major structural issues. Yeah, I, is China's savings rate too high, Ding Yao? I mean, forty-five percent is, I think, a relatively high level compared to. Mm -hmm global levels, but are there behavioral changes perhaps across generations? Mm. So the younger generation perhaps may be spending a little bit more, at least the mindset is shifting more towards consumption. Uh, yeah, so 45 is very high. Uh, not many countries uh, uh, take over China on that aspect. I think probably only Singapore. Mm -hmm. But Singapore has a kind of a forced uh, saving scheme, right? Uh, but before the financial crisis, uh, China's uh, saving rate was even higher. In 2008, uh, it was uh, 52 percent. Oh, wow. mm. <laughs> so before the pandemic, uh, uh, China's uh, saving rate uh, came down quite a lot. Okay. So, uh, I think uh, after structural changes, uh, you, you know, it's natural to see the saving rate to come down. Mm -hmm. right? So uh, actually, I don't worry that much. I mean, on one hand, uh, uh, China still needs investment, uh, not just uh, invest into infrastructure like this, uh, but also into R&D, right? Yeah. So, so we need mm -hmm. a certain amount of savings. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, when the benefits of economic growth uh, uh, are more fairly distributed to ordinary people, consumption goes up uh, naturally. I mean, it's not an incident, a coincidence, and that uh, after financial crisis, uh, China's income distribution has become better. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. but, but the, the pandemic has mm -hmm. changed everything. Yeah, yeah. Right? So saving rate went up, mm -hmm. uh, in quarter went up. Right? So we need, you know, I don't know, five years, 10 years, mm -hmm. Uh, to change back again to the right track. Mm. Mm. But doesn't that show the consumption potential, I guess, of the Chinese market? Because if you have such a high savings rate, mm. I mean, the U.S. is what, single digits? 
Mm -hmm. uh, right now, China has a middle income population of about 400 million plus. That mm -hmm. number is expected to double to 800 million plus by 2035. Mm -hmm. uh, can we expect then consumption to really rise in the next 10 to 15 uh, years? I, I don't worry about that, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, as I said, before the pandemic, China's saving rate came down came quite down. significantly mm -hmm. by uh, seven potential points. Maybe no, we, eight years. Do we do we know why there, that is it the high saving rate? Because they have to save for education, for social safety net. So can, do we know what is the main cause for the uh, high saving rate? So uh, then, therefore, uh, you know what uh, policies to uh, uh, address. That's a, that's the a long story, already, but uh, to make it a short, I think that's because of industrialization and also China's uh, huge growth of exports. Mm. Uh, actually, the largest increase. Uh, uh, was uh, not uh, among households. It was actually among corporations. Oh, okay. Corporate mm -hmm. savings uh, increased mm. tremendously. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Okay, as the share of mm. GDP, mm. household saving uh, was even lower mm. than before. Okay. Okay. Mm. So, uh, say we, it was all about mm. the exports, the industrialization. Yeah. Mm. Okay. And after the financial crisis. Uh, uh, China's export growth slowed down. Mm. Right? Uh, ordinary people uh, got a larger share from output. Mm. Right? So income distribution became better. Mm. So ordinary people, of course, mm. would consume more. So consumption as a share of GDP mm. went up. Yeah. So that, that, that's yeah. the story. But the pandemic, yeah, I mean, yeah, every country, right, yeah. inequality yeah. goes up. Mm. It takes a while, I think, for economies to readjust yeah. after right. the pandemic. Yeah. But have the long-term structural drivers of growth and development, you think, uh, Dinyao in China, have, have that changed? Yes. Uh, from export uh, to innovation, mm. technological progress. Uh, look, look at the, the last decade. Uh, China, almost uh, overnight, has moved uh, to the frontier of several uh, key industries, for example, AI, mm. um, solar panel power, mm. wind power, mm -hmm. and uh, electric like cars. Electric yes. Yeah. Right, <laughs> EVs, yeah. right? So, uh, I mean, uh, e over the next uh, decade or two decades, uh, I think those uh, three areas are going to dominate uh, the world economy. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, so China, fortunately, uh, has uh, been on the forefront mm -hmm. of technologies uh, in those three sectors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But then analysts say aging demographics. That is something that economists perhaps worry about mm -hmm. the Chinese economy. Are you seeing the investments perhaps in human capital, in productivity, that can perhaps offset China's demographic structure? How concerned are you about that, Dean Yao? Uh, in terms of the supply side, uh, I think uh, the improvement of human capital is going to more than offset. More than offset. Yeah, okay. uh, the decline of the uh, labor force mm. in China. Mm. Um, so actually, I, I did a paper oh, okay. on this. Mm. Uh, you compare uh, the rate of return to education mm -hmm. of young people mm -hmm. uh, in their 20s, and the rate of return to education of older people like mm. in their 50s. Mm. Uh, the, the young people's rate of return mm. uh, almost a double, mm. o almost a double, mm. uh, the rate of return mm. of old people, which mm. means uh, the quality of education has mm. been improved, mm. Mm. right? Uh, and also the amount of education young people have uh, is much higher than old mm -hmm. people, mm -hmm. right? So adding together, I think we're going to more than offset mm. the mm. decline of labor force. Mm -hmm. So. Today, we are more worried about uh, unemployment, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> not the lack of labor. Okay. So I, I, I really don't think uh, aging is going to affect uh, China's mm. growth on mm. the supply side. Mm. The only uh, dragging factor is social security. Mm. Mm. That's a huge mm. challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Right. How are we going to pay the, the pension, my generation? The pension. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the pension. Healthcare. Healthcare. Yeah. Healthcare. Yeah. Uh, healthcare is going to become a huge problem. Uh, uh, is there thinking about raising the retirement age, increasing women in the labor force, labor, labor participation rate of women? 
Yes, they have been talking <laughs> for <laughs> decades, <laughs> but no action. Yeah. People don't like it, <laughs> particularly women. Right? They can retire at the age of 50, can you believe? <laughs> oh, 50, wow. <laughs> well, I mean, it, this is a question I think many global economies face right yeah. now, uh, aging population, because it's not just, I guess, in China and in many of the advanced economies, even in some of the ASEAN economies, yeah, I yeah, think, yeah. we Thailand, are seeing demographic Thailand is challenges. Already aging. Yeah, Thailand mm -hmm. is already aging. So as economies mm -hmm. develop, as they mature a little bit more, yeah, yeah. we're going to see perhaps aging demographics, and this will be, I think, a perennial yeah, issue yeah. that many economies mm -hmm. will have to deal with mm -hmm. going forward. Um, Mari, I want to get your take on ASEAN's role in all of this in the global economy. Mm -hmm. How does ASEAN, or Southeast Asia in general, general view itself because it's still such a dynamic part of the world, robust mm -hmm. growth, even though the Asian Development Bank recently sort of lowered, revised down its forecast mm -hmm. a little bit for Southeast Asia, about 4.6%, if I'm not mistaken, but relatively great workforce, uh, a lot of investment in the area as well. How do you see ASEAN's role in the global economy today with all the perhaps <laughs> external challenges that we see? Well, basically, you know, we just came, we just finished the ASEAN summit uh, two weeks ago, so mm. there was a lot of talk about your question. Uh, and okay, they lowered the uh, projection for uh, ASEAN to 4.6%, but by the way, that's still the highest growth still high. for any region. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, you know, the lowering growth is because the external situation is really not very conducive. Yeah. R real quick, Mari, for yeah. our audience, so the IMF forecasts global growth this year will be 3%, yeah. so Southeast Asia at 4.6%. Quite robust still. Yes, so. right. Please. Uh, and the highest amongst uh, all the regions in the world. Uh, so I, I think, uh, you know, Southeast Asia has the benefit uh, of already having uh, economic integration between ourselves as well as mm. with the, the East Asia region. So for us, regional integration, economic integration has been part of our DNA as the way we, we develop. And ASEAN as a region, right, uh, I think it's like the fourth or fifth uh, largest if you, you take it as a region as a whole, yeah, yeah. Uh, in the world, and it's got a 650 million population. Uh, so I think we, we can be, uh, uh, certainly for growth and investment prospects, uh, I think we are s certainly in a, in a good space. Uh, and domestically, all the, the countries are doing uh, their part in the, in the reforms. Uh, second, I think we try very hard to position ourselves so that we are not caught in the battle between the two elephants. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the way we do that is we engage, Both sides. We, we continue regional integration, mm. and at the same time we continue to engage with uh, China, with US, uh, as well as with Europe. Because these are still our uh, major markets as well, as mm -hmm. well as for innovation, mm -hmm. for investment. So uh, this is why I, I, I know you had some skepticism about <laughs> regional <laughs> integration. But I think a lot of these regional uh, pathways, somehow they will influence each other. You know, what, what CPP, CPTPP agreed on in digital will probably influence what RCEP will, will, mm -hmm. uh, will adv mm -hmm. uh, advance towards in digital. Mm. Uh, what IPEF is discussing on resilient supply chain uh, would probably influence how we would look at how we would also try to influence what the U.S. is co going to define as resilient supply chain, so as not to hurt our supply chain that's in the region. Because yeah. the prediction is that supply chains are going to become more regional, mm. yeah, in, mm -hmm. and and more with geographical proximate air, air countries and so on and so forth. So I think it's in our interest. To, to really have a voice, not just for our own regional integration, but how it evolves in other places because it will impact on us. Because yeah. our uh, principle has always been openness, transparency. Uh, the open part is very important because RCEP is intended to have more members come in. Yeah. Uh, we are still waiting for India. India was mm -hmm. supposed to join, but India mm -hmm. didn't join at the last minute, but you know they're still there. Uh, and if you had India in there, you would have half of the world. Yeah. Uh, be in that regional <laughs> conversation, right. yeah. but not, not without all its headaches. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I mean, do you foresee then even stronger China-ASEAN cooperation? Because like you yes, mentioned, yes, China now yeah. and ASEAN yeah. 
two biggest trading yeah, partners yeah. for each other. Last yeah. year, nearly a trillion U.S. Yeah, dollars yeah. of trade. Right. That's higher, at least yeah. last year, yeah. uh, compared to the U.S. and EU yeah. trade. Yeah. We have infrastructure connectivity going mm -hmm. throughout, I guess, the region. Have you tried the high-speed rail between I Jakarta did, and Bandung? I did, and I How was, was that experience? I felt very proud that yeah. we could have a high-speed train in my own country. And it was like technologically so superior, right? And it didn't feel any different from the high-speed train that I tried in China. Right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, I think it's, okay, it had lots of issues with it. Maybe it, it was not uh, uh, as it should have been, but it's the first time. Mm -hmm. That actually China has done a high-speed train uh, in 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 another country. Uh, in, in another country. I, and I guess yeah. Southeast Asia. In, Southeast, this would be in the, the southern the first hemisphere. Yeah, yeah high-speed rail. Mm -hmm. So a lot of learnings. We'll, yeah. we'll also learn. Uh, China side right. also learn. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's going to be good for for the future, right? Should uh, be good for global growth for in global terms of growth. stronger China stronger, ASEAN. Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, we are uh, renegotiating the ASEAN China free trade area. Version 3.0. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Okay. So uh, there will be lots of opportunities to. To reflect, uh, you know, there have been pluses and minuses uh, in, in, in what has happened in the last 20 years, Is mm -hmm. it 20, almost 20 years, mm -hmm. be, uh, 2005, we, we signed the ASEAN-China Free Trade Area. Uh, you know, we, we can learn and reflect and uh, address the new issues and new challenges, including mm -hmm. climate change, I would yeah. say, within that. Yeah. So speaking of climate change, um, Professor Pangastu, and, and Ding Yao, feel free to jump in any time as well. China has, of course, the dual carbon goals, right? peaking carbon emissions by the year 2030 and then achieving carbon neutrality by 2060, which means China needs to reach net zero at a faster pace compared to many of the developed economies in the world. That, in my books, has scale effects. If you mm -hmm. make that big of a jump that quick, um, what do you think China's contribution can be to Southeast Asia as it transitions itself into a more carbon neutral economy? Um, I guess how big do you think the spillover effects will be? From what China is doing to... From what China yeah. is doing. I mean, can we see more green technology from uh, China yes, being yes. diffused into Southeast Asia? Can there be learning experiences? Can Southeast Asian companies invest in China and bring technology back to the region? What do you think? Yeah. Uh, I, I think in, in a perfect world without all the conflicts, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was also doing some research on this, uh, you know, critical mineral supply issue and... Uh, Indonesia and has a lot of Yes, I know, <laughs> yeah. So uh, it, it's, um, I think, I, I'm, I'm just worried that a lot of this fragmentation within the, the green supply chain, the carbon, mm. the decarbonization supply chain, uh, will actually increase the cost and the speed and the scale that we, we should be doing uh, with decarbonization. But anyway, uh, the opportunity is there if we, if we make sure that uh, a, a lot of the uh, issues about the uh, supply chain, in the green supply chain, they, they're using security issues, like the, the concentration of the supply of uh, critical minerals, as well as the concentration of the supply of solar panels, wind turbine, uh, EV batteries, it's very concentrated, right? So I would hope that the in the diversification and the deconcentration that happens, that uh, this can actually be where Southeast Asia can be a partner, not just to China, but also mm. to the US. Mm. I mean, mm. uh, I Indonesia, Philippines, and Vietnam, we do have minerals, and mm. Chinese investments are already in Indonesia to process these minerals, mm -hmm. and, and then eventually it can also go into the EV batteries. Yeah. And you know, also solar panels. Vietnam is already uh, producing solar mm -hmm. panels. So I, I think it should hopefully be through investment as well as diffusion of technology mm. that we can uh, also become, you can uh, deconcentrate, if you like, the, the production of these very critical uh, upstream uh, as well as downstream elements of the, of the, of the uh, decarbonization supply chain. Which is going to be so important for not just for us, uh, mm. for not for China, and for Southeast Asia, but for the rest of the world, for Africa, yeah. uh, for uh, even in the U.S. You know, they, mm. uh, I think they, they, they still import <laughs> solar panels yeah. from China. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, otherwise, yeah. uh, they don't they don't have enough uh, production. And, yeah. and I mean, the last thing I would say is that you know we we focus so much on this. I, I just came from Beijing, where we had this uh, global energy transition forum organized by DRC, and I think we, 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 we tend to focus too much on the coal exit and then the renewable energy, but there's actually a lot of investments that's needed on the infrastructure, mm. on the grid, on mm -hmm. the, you know, uh, 
we will still have coal and fossil fuel for maybe at least another 20 years, mm -hmm. 30 mm -hmm. years even. Right. So the, the cap ca carbon capture, the sink, carbon mm -hmm. sink, mm -hmm. Uh, is is an important element in this transition, which mm -hmm. which is at the moment uh, perhaps something that that actually is nobody's kind of dominating this in any way. So it's it's a w an area where maybe maybe this is an area for <laughs> cooperation. That's an expensive yeah. area. It's <laughs> yeah, a yeah, lot of yeah. investment. Because you know, in, in you technology. know you were talking earlier about U.S. China uh, relations. How can we? put a floor to it and then find areas. I think we have to find areas where US and China can, mm -hmm. can, can, co can collaborate while yeah. still continuing to have these issues. Are there areas where US chi China can collaborate? And yeah. a lot of people fo uh, give climate change as an example. Yeah. yeah, so hopefully we don't see the bifurcation perhaps of the green yes. supply yeah, chain. Because that is the hope. Yeah, because that it, you, you shouldn't because of the urgency exactly. of yeah. the issue. And it affects, I think, developing economies, yes, lower exactly. income economies yeah. as well, especially yeah. Southeast Asia, a lot of the major yeah. cities along yeah. the coastline. Um, Danielle, what about you? Your thoughts in terms of what China's green transition means maybe mm. for Southeast Asia and for the global economy at large? Well, it's uh, in general, uh, a great news uh, for the world uh, uh, and also for ASEAN countries. I mean, China started uh, quite earlier, almost 20 years, years ago, ago. Yeah. Uh, producing s uh, solar panels, uh, wind, uh, wind power equipment. Right? So now China uh, has uh, more advanced technologies than most countries, uh, including the United States. Right? Um, but the uh, United States and also Europe right, set a really high tariff mm -hmm. on China's uh, uh, alternative energy equipment. I think that's wrong that uh, you know, China, in a sense, has paid the cost mm -hmm. for humankind uh, for 20 years mm -hmm. to produce those mm -hmm. solar power you know, equipments. Uh, they are really polluting. Mm -hmm. China polluted itself. right? to in improve the technology. And now it's, uh, it's good for the whole world because this mm -hmm. is a new technology. Mm -hmm. uh, you were talking about uh, industrial policy, competition of industrial mm -hmm. policy. But if the industrial policy is uh, used to produce new technology, mm -hmm. that's going to be good for the whole mm -hmm. humankind. Yeah. But if you just uh, compete, you know, the other country has this te mm -hmm. technology, I want them to have it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't give me, I'm going to produce yeah, by myself. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, total yeah. waste, yeah, right? Yeah. So in a sense, uh, I think ASEAN has been playing a constructive role, uh, some kind of a bridging rule, mm -hmm. uh, role uh, for China and the rest of the mm -hmm. world. So China has uh, shipped uh, many producti production mm -hmm. ca capacities uh, to ASEAN countries mm -hmm. to produce uh, solar mm -hmm. power. Yes. I'm not sure, right? Mm -hmm. Solar power, wind power yeah. equipment. Mm -hmm. And then from ASEAN countries, uh, those equipment uh, are export uh, to other countries, yes. right? Uh, some hawks uh, in the U.S. Uh, say, no, 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 uh, wait a minute, we have to tax <laughs> American imports by the orange of uh, producers, which yeah. means that they want to tax China. Yeah, uh, so they, even though it's produced in Indonesia, right. if it's coming from a Chinese company, right. It's beginning to come mm. in as kind right, of a, right. a red flag. Yeah, yeah <laughs> but that's just a talk. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't think a U.S. Uh, will be crazy like uh, that. We hope. We hope not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That would be a bad news, right? Yeah, yeah. For the whole world. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> mm, right. Yeah. Uh, so you know, China ASEAN uh, cooperation mm -hmm. is a stabilizing uh, factor. Uh, for this region and also for the whole world. Mm. Is a, this is a win-win collaboration. Mm. Yeah. And I guess final question to both of you. We can't say globalization is dead, right? That is too extreme of, an ex uh, of a statement. Perhaps we have to reimagine or improve what globalization looks like for, I, I guess, the benefit of mankind. How do we tackle these common challenges? If you could give advice to policymakers today in terms of how we can improve on globalization, Right. What would you say? Professor, maybe we'll yeah. start with you. I, I, I don't like the word deglobalization, <laughs> uh, and it, is, it, won't, it would, ha would not happen. I would say we need to reshape globalization and recognize 
you know, learn from what's happened. And I think domestically, we do have to have a better uh, handle on, on the kind of social policies that address inequality, lack of distribution, and so on. And that is about better targeted uh, social policies or, so, or compensation policies. Mm. And then uh, we need to continue the trade and investment and openness on the financial sector and capital flows and investment because that, has, that is still... Uh, that is still the way to go, but we have to recognize that there are all these security s resilience concerns. So I would say policymakers domestically, we need to be competitive, increase our productivity, invest mm. in human capital, do the reforms, but we also need to play a role in shaping uh, the, w the global economic order that, that will not hurt us as third countries in the, in the battle between the two elephants. Yeah. So I'm calling for middle powers for regions like ASEAN, to yeah. really step forward to maintain the global economic order, I, you know, it's not it's it's not a, it's not broken. There, it needs to be updated. It needs yeah. to be changed. But we all need to play a role in that. But quick follow up: How difficult do you think it is for perhaps middle powers to maintain that sense of resiliency I in this kind of era? How difficult is that going to be? It's difficult, but yeah. it's actually they should recognize, this is something we've been talking a lot about in the region, we should all recognize the high cost yeah. of not doing it. Yeah. The high cost and the high risk, and it's going to hurt, it's, it, it will hurt US and China, and you, but it will also hurt the rest of us, and especially those poor countries who are, who are not already part of the uh, trading and investment uh, system. They are, they are even gonna be more left out. Yeah. Danielle, your thoughts on this? How do we reshape, reimagine, improve globalization? Uh, currently, I see a lot of sentiments uh, flowing around, right? sentiments, a dominant uh, rationality. Uh, I hope uh, that all the countries uh, will bring rationality back. Right? Um, I think to the West, uh, it's a, a strike that uh, the world is not converging particularly. Uh, so perhaps in the future, not just a short future, but a longer future, uh, the West has to learn a way to coexist with countries with different political system. And then the task uh, for all the countries uh, globally is to create uh, of a new world order that are in different political systems, that they economically integrate world system. Mm. That's going to be really hard, but let's not uh, lose help. Yeah. <laughs> I guess globalization in a more multipolar world, mm -hmm. it's going to be difficult. There will be challenges, but at least that sense of hope and optimism we have to maintain, right? So openness, inclusiveness, how do we build more communication and dialogue? That's mm -hmm. at least what we're trying to find here at the Bund Summit yes. uh, in Shanghai. All right, so thank you so much for joining us, Dean Yao Yang okay. and Professor Pan Gestu. Thank you so much. Thank you. And that's going to wrap up this edition of Bund Econ Talk, a very special edition of this talk here on CGTN. I'm Michael Wong here at the fifth Bund Summit in Shanghai. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you again next time.